And what we're going to see now is a development. Right? How things went after she died. Right? Um, <coughs> all of you are very well aware of these types of statements. Uh, this one from William Johnson. Some Adventists today think that our beliefs have remained unchanged over the years, or they seek to turn back the clock to some point when we had everything just right. But all attempts to recover such historic Adventism fail in view of the facts of our heritage. Adventist beliefs have changed over the years under the impact of present truth. The most startling is the teaching regarding Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. So that's up front. It's in your face, really, saying that our beliefs have changed <coughs> over the years. And I would say this one thing to, to you or anyone watching this video. Truth never changes. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. If it was true yesterday, it must be true today, and it'd be true forever. What was error yesterday must still be error today because error can never change. You can develop truth. You can have a truth and you can build on it. You can build on it. But what it was in the first place, the truth, it's still the truth no matter how much you build on it. Terry, you can have progressive revelation that's still building on truth. That's what you're saying. Yes, mm -hmm. you can build on truth and more and more and more. But the initial truth remains the same. Mm -hmm. It is still true. Now what we are saying as a church today is that what our church was teaching concerning Christ and what Ellen White endorsed as the truth about Christ, our church is saying today, no, it was error. And that, that is very important to remember in this history. Uh, he continues, many of the pioneers included James White, Jane Andrews, Gerard Smith, J.H. Wagner, how to an Aryan or semi-Aryan view. And I'm not going to go into that because those are ambiguous words. It depends on how you interpret um, the, these little terminologies. But he says that is that the sun at some point in time before the creation of our world was generated by the Father. He says that was the error. That was the mistake. Right? And the emphasis here, of course, is time again. It's always the problem of time. And it's not really the problem. The, <coughs> the whole issue regarding the Son of God as to who he really is, it's who he is and who he came out of. It's not time. Time doesn't really have anything to do with it. He says only gradually did this false doctrine, that's what the pioneers were teaching, what Alan White endorsed, only gradually did this false doctrine give way to biblical truth and largely under the impact of Adam White's writings and statements such as in Christ's life we are not unborrowed and we arrived. And I believe that's the most abused and misused statement in uh, writings of Adam White, but I can't go into that now. Uh, Fernando McNally in our Handbook of Theology says uh, monogenesis does not contain the ideal of begetting, but rather of uniqueness. And when applied to Christ, emphasizes his unique relationship with the Father. And I ask the question, what makes him unique? Mm. You see, if you have all three the same, mm. and they all have the same relationship mm. to each other, how is his relationship unique? It should be the same. Unique, you have to be a one-off. You can't have three uniques. <laughs> Not based on the same principle, anyway. Canali continues, There is therefore no ground within the biblical understanding of God, therefore the idea of the generation of the Son from the Father. We would dispute it. We would say it, it was there. He is truly Christ begotten Son. This is the statement when, that we read yesterday. She said, there is not a people on earth who hold more firmly to the truth of Christ's pre-existence than do Seventh-day Adventists in 1893. It was just five years after Minneapolis and all those articles we, we saw in the Review and Herald, Signs of the Times, and wherever have you, saying that this is what Seventh-day Adventists were teaching regarding Christ. So you're faced up with a problem, really. You're going to believe Alan White, you're going to believe William Johnson. 
We think about it. Think about it. These are days, I'm not going to say too much about our book, simply because the claims about bioleadership in this book change the thing that said more, which is the current. That's where they get the claim for it that this book changed the thinking of Seventh-day Adventists. And what I found is, plenty of claims, no evidence, or Stella White was alive. I've, I've looked through all of our records, and it was just said to be a lovely little book about the life of Christ. And I can't see anywhere where anyone said, oh, look, she's saying that God is a trinity, or, or Christ is not truly the Son of God. I searched and searched and searched, and I've not found it. Claims, majority, if not all, came after the death of Anna White. I think if somebody had made those claims to her while she was alive, she would have had something to say about it. I believe the 1919 Bible Conference was a pattern of things to come. Now, just before that conference, all right, F.M. Wilcox, Review and Herald, he is referring to a conference on Christian fundamentals that a group of our people uh, went to, invited to. It was our privilege to attend the latter part of last month in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a conference on leading of leading Christian workers on Christian fundamentals. The conference was interdenominational. Delegates were registered from 40 states of the United States, Canada, British Columbia, Central America, China, Japan, India, and England. He's now quoting the promoters. The promoters of the conference are convinced that from this gathering there should go forth to Christians everywhere a ringing call to a united testimony unto the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Again, quoting the promoters. All over the world are groups of devout, faithful believers, still true and loyal to the whole world of God, these at present are widely scattered and nominally separated. The supreme objective of this conference is to unite all in such a worldwide fellowship to the end that we may all speak with one voice an unhesitating affirmation, affirmation of the things which are verily believed amongst us as Christians. This is Wilcox now. Near the close of the convention, a statement of general doctrine and belief was prepared by a committee on resolutions, similar to our types of conference, really, isn't it? And enthusiastically adopted by the 3,000 men and women who filled the Academy of Music where the convention was held. The pronouncement expresses, for the most part, the fundamentals of Christian belief upon which the great majority of evangelical Christians unite. The statement is as follows. We believe in one God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He added, we believe that Jesus Christ was begotten by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary and his true God and true man. And I would suggest that this begotten here, it's, it's alluding to uh, the incarnation, it's alluding to Bethlehem, not to a pre-existent son. And very often this, you'll find, is the belief of the evangelicals. Right. Uh, Wilcox. To the general formal expression of this pronouncement, with the exception of the last article which concerned the immortality of the soul, we can give hearty assent. In other words, we agree with it wholeheartedly. Right. He continues by then detailing what we believe. 1919, this is on. He says that the Trinity consists of the Eternal Father, a personal spiritual being, omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient, infinite in power, wisdom, and love, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, and the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, etc. Cleverly worded, but it's not a Trinitarian statement but it would suit both sides of the camp, all right? He's, he's not saying the one God consists of the eternal God, etc. He says the Trinity. And later on, you know, in our 1931 fundamental beliefs, he says God and all Trinity. Two different words, two different concepts, but they come across looking the same. It was the first step in this apostasy towards 
uh, us accepting the Trinity doctrine. 1990 Bible conference was two main areas of discussion. One, the person of Jesus, given by W. W. Prescott, and then there was the Eastern question, the daily of Daniel 8, which we know is a huge controversy about, and the identity of the King of the North. And we're not going to talk about the second one here, talking about the first one. And what actually happened, Prescott would give a presentation, and someone else would give a presentation later on on this one, and they would come back then, open discussion between all the delegates. All right? So we'll concentrate on the one by uh, Prescott. Daniel, then General Pre uh, General Conwell's president said this. For some years there has been, this was in his open address, all right? For some years there has been an earnest desire that we should have a special meeting for the study of various phases of our truth. When the question first arose, it was in the form of a proposal to meet and study some mooted questions. Questions that were being discussed, some things that were being a bit doubtful, some things that one person said this and one person said something else. And for a long time, it was the uppermost thought in the proposal. He said it should be a simple Bible conference, not spend our time magnifying differences and studying minor questions, but we would give, first of all, careful study to the major questions, the great essentials, the fundamentals. Here he says, who is allowed to go to the conference? The action of the General Conference Committee with reference to the personnel at the conference was to be the members of the General Conference Committee in America who could attend, the Bible and history teachers in our colleges, junior colleges and seminars, and a number of our leading editors in this country. The ordinary minister was not allowed to attend. He was not given permission. A.D. Dennis went on to say, since the appointment, a great many people have wanted to come to the conference, and we have not been able to open the door. It then goes on to say, again, about many people. Another thing is that a good many people feel very much afraid of what we are going to do. They wonder if we're going to fix up a creed for them to sub subscribe to. They are very much disturbed about it. So you see, Although some have called this a secret Bible conference, and I call it that, and Washburn, when he wrote an open letter to the conference about the Trinity Doctrine coming in back in, what's that, 1950, 40, 40 whatever, he slammed this conference that, that, that went on. You right? should read his words about it. But you see, it's, it's keep talking about many people. So a lot of people knew it was going to take a place, but the only thing was they didn't know what was going to take place, and you'll see later that when it came to an end, they still didn't know. A.G. Janus again, the secrecy alarms them. We've never had anything like this before, and they are very fearful. Some almost felt we ought to abandon the plan and stop because of this difficulty. You see, this was well discussed, and, and seven downs as were afraid, really afraid, of what was going on. But now listen to this. Same dress. A few weeks ago, I was in Minneapolis, and I went to hear Dr. Riley, the pastor of First Baptist Church there, who was an active leader in a series of Bible conferences being held on the second coming of Christ. One of these was held in Philadelphia. We just spoke about right? The and some of our brethren attended. They are holding them in 17 cities all over the country. He, rightly said, the object of these Bible conferences is to draw in men and emphasize the divine origin of the book, scriptures, and the deity of the Son of God. Obviously, in terms of the Trinity doctrine. And to lead men away back to the original faith of Protestantism for salvation. Now that's loaded. That's, that last sentence is loaded. And I'm going to let Adrian talk about that tonight. I'm not going to say it anymore. All right? I'm sure you have quite, quite a bit to say about that. A.D. Daniels, it impressed me very much. And I felt there was a place for the Seventh-day Adventists to hold a good, strong Bible conference every year. I believe this ought to be the beginning of an annual Bible conference for this people. That was his opening address. Okay? 
Now, we come to Prescott's daily presentation on the person of Christ. Daniel says, the way is now for anyone who wishes to do so to ask Professor Prescott questions concerning the topic of the morning. And here we're going to go with a bang, bang, bang of the conversations that took place, all right? Now, you watch it, and you'll see it's the same conversations that we are having today, exactly the same, no different. Uh, w. Howell. I would like to ask Professor Prescott if he is willing to enlarge just a little on the point at the beginning, as he explained it this morning when he's talking about John 1, 1 in the beginning. Taking the first chapter of John, replies Prescott, uh, the third verse, at a certain point where finite beings begin time, it does not mean that this is where the word began. Later, can we go one step further and say that the word was without beginning? First off, I was going to raise the question, are we agreed in such a general statement as this, that the Son of God is co-eternal with the Father? Is that the view that is taught in our schools? Sir Ransom, it's taught in the Bible. <laughs> Prescott comes back, not to teach that is Arianism. All you continue to circulate in the standard book, what standard book do you think? All we continue to circulate in a standard book, a statement that the Son is not co-eternal, that the Son is not co-eternal, meaning all the same age, or co-eternal with the Father, that makes him a finite being. Any being whose beginning we can fix is a finite being. He then went on to say, we have been circulating 40 years a standard book which says that the Son is not co-eternal with the Father. That is Arianism. Prescott, do we want to go on teaching that? Now, what's happened here, he's done a complete U-turn. Complete U-turn. Because when Alan White was alive, when, you know, out in Australia, out here, his statement was, Christ was twice born, once in eternity, the only begotten of the Father, and again here in the flesh. So now he's, he switched sides. Foreman, I would like to ask, do you think it's necessary or even helpful in the divine and Christian doctrine to go outside of the New Testament for terms to use in this definition? The scripture says Christ is the only begotten of the Father. Why should we go further than that and say he was co-eternal with the Father? Also, to say, to teach otherwise, is Arianism. Mm -hmm. Good question. Mm -hmm. Prescott, I think the expression I am is the equivalent of eternity. I think these expressions, while they do not use the term co-eternal, are equivalent in their meaning. Trust God, there's a proper sense as I view it. Now watch the progression now of thought. There is a proper sense as I view it, according to which the Son is subordinate to the Father, but that subordination is not in the question of attributes or of his existence. It is simply in the fact of his derived existence. As we read in John 20, 5, 26, For as the Father had life in himself, even so he gave the Son also to have life. In himself. Using the terms goes on Presco as we use them, the Son is co eternal with the Father. That does not prevent his being the only begotten Son of God. There is no contradiction, said Presco, to say that the Son is co eternal with the Father, and yet the Son to say the Son is the only begotten of the Father. Now you have gone back to Nicaea is everlastingly begotten of the Father. This is the progression now. Uh, whereas we used to say it some, uh, in eternity, sometime in eternity, that's not the correct phrase to use it really, sometime in eternity, but, sorry, but you know what I mean. <laughs> in eternity, he came out of the Father. But what we have now here is, is, is the progression. He's everlastingly begotten. Born. I think we should hold to Bible definitions. Prescott, we take the expression co-eternal, and that is better. <laughs> wow. What a statement. Where do we go? 
Bormann, Antiochian school of thinking. Prescott, Alexandrian school of thinking. It's as simple as that. What a statement to make. We take the expression co-eternal and that is better than what the scriptures say. Lacey, you all know about Lacey? Mm -hmm. If Jesus is divine, he must, have had that, he must have that essential attribute. And I, and so I have dared to say that Christ is absolutely co-eternal with the Father. You cannot say that back in some point of duration the Son appeared, and prior to that he had not appeared. I think we ought not to teach that there was a time when he, the Father, produced another being who was called his son. Totally against everything that was taught in Seventh-day Adventism. But I would say this to you. This was still being taught in the Seventh-day Adventist church then. In our Sabbath school lessons, in our papers, in our books. What is going on here is something different than what was in the minds of the laity. The leaders were thinking differently than laity. Now, uh, go on to July the 6th now. Cavernous. And all these people, remember, uh, they're top ranking people. Uh, and on the website, I detail you know, their, their positions, etc. And you can look it up in the encyclopedias. These are all really top ranking uh, people. He says, I missed a good deal of the discussion, and I do not know whether the idea is, it, is that we are to accept the so called Trinitarian doctrine or not. He latched on quick, didn't he? Uh, he latched on quick. What he did, what he did after, he went on expanding the faith of Seventh day Adventists about Christ being truly the Son of God. What happens then? The Nocrophers' notes says this Elder Daniels here made suggestions up to the delegates to not become uneasy because we are studying a subject that we cannot comprehend. He asks these not to be transcribed. Mm -hmm. So whatever he said is lost. Um, I don't know, perhaps some people uh, knew about it verbally or something like that, but as far as on record was concerned, it wasn't put down. Nothing at all. So we're only left to imagine what he said. And imagination can run wild at times, but I think we can all have a good idea as to what he really did say. Discussions continue. Then he says this, perhaps we have discussed this as long as we need to. We are not going to take a vote on Trinitarianism or Arianism, but we can think, let's go on with this thing. Now you see, it's there in the mind. It's all there. The, the, what the objective was, it was all there at that time. John Isaac, a rather frustrated John Isaac it seems, what are we Bible teachers going to do? We have heard ministers talk one way. Our students have had Bible teachers in one school spend days and days upon this question. Then they come to another school and the teacher does not agree with them. We ought to have something definite so that we might give an answer. I think it can be done. We ought to have it clearly stated was Christ ever begotten or not? Or this thing or that thing? You can sense the frustration thing. But do you notice what we say? It is taught in some of our schools. See, it, it was already there, you see. It was already there. This is only a four, four years after the death of my It was already there. I mean, that white knew it was there. She knew all the things that were going on. And all what we're talking about this Trinity doctrine and, and the, the taking on board of this and, and the getting together with the other world nations, that was all waiting in the wings whilst Ellen White was alive. There is no doubt about that. Right? It didn't just happen after she died. Common sense tells you it was there waiting in the wings. Daniels, this one makes me smart. Perhaps in another study we might have a study on the word be gone. I thought this morning when Brother Bowman spoke of it, if we could have five or ten minutes on that word, bringing the law of precise meaning in that interpretation, it would be well. But we have to drop it here this time. Five and ten minutes on the word we've got. You must be joking. You know? Uh, but this was it. 
this, this was this was how it was. I mean, we, scholars have been discussing this for donkey's years. You know, <laughs> that there's still two extreme camps. Uh, Gerhard Fandel, associate director of the Research Institute. This discussion, talking about 1919, indicates that 20 years after Alan White's clear statement on the eternal divinity of Christ, he's talking about in Desire of Ages, of course, and his absolute equality with the Father, many in the church still held on to the idea that Christ, although divine, <coughs> had a beginning. He was just talking about the leaders. 99% of the laity believed it. It was the standard denominational teaching of the church. The big question, what to do with the stenographer's notes? Now I've got a whole list of things that the um, delegates to that conference said about those notes. But I've just given you two here that it represents all that they said. Thompson, I think the publishing of this matter would sow season of division and discord. And as far as I'm concerned, I am not in favour of sending out anything. Daniels, President, General Conference, I sometimes think it would be just as well to lock this manuscript up in a vault and have anyone who wishes to do so come here for personal study and research. And that is exactly what happened, what Daniel says here. They were put in the archives. Uh, it says here, I've just written in my own words, in the 1919 Bible Conference notes were discovered in 1974 by Donald Yates. Uh, this was one year after the seventh Adventist archives was established. He was put in charge. It was also, coincidentally, my words, when Trinitarianism had become established within Seventh-day Adventism. They were just hidden away in the archives, mm -hmm. and nobody, apart from those people that attended there, and maybe certain people that they told, I don't know, nobody knew what was in those notes. Now, I'm going to come to something else here. And I think this is important, what I'm saying here, <coughs> because I believe seven hours of the day are being fed with a misunderstanding of our history. Review article, Michael Campbell, he's talking about 1919 Bible Conference. Most of the differences amongst the participants at the conference revolved around issue in Seventh-day Adventist eschatology. Issues such as the identity of the King of the North in Daniel and problematic dates in the sequence of prophetic chronology. I looked at that and I went through this article. There was nothing there about the discussions that, that, about the person of Christ. Nothing! Totally silence. And I thought, I can't believe. I can't honestly believe what I'm reading. You know? Campbell went on to say, most Adventists would quickly yawn and lose interest if they were somehow transported back in time to the 1919 Bible. <laughs> <laughs> now then, come on, let's be fair. Would you lose interest? <laughs> what, you, what year did he say that? This is yes, the year. year. It's it's January. 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 Yeah. That's a way to see in state. I mean, isn't? would you lose interest? I mean, if you go back, I can go back on this one. Can I go back? Yeah. If it was, even if it was true, even if it was true that it was about the King of the North and dates, etc., etc., should Adventism yawn at it? What's that saying about Seventh day Adventists today? Terrible things, you know, what's, what's being said today. Do you know, I believe, I'm not watching my time, but. I believe this is this is this is automatically suggesting something to the mind mm. that these things ought to be a bore to Seventh Day Adventists. It's a suggestion not to get involved and study them. Yeah, they were quickly young, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing in there. I wonder if you if you put in that article what those discussions really were about Christ. Whether he would get away with making that statement, mm. I wouldn't think so. When I got to the end, I thought, I can't believe it. I thought, why don't these people go back and study their history? You know, study it properly, you know, and to know what they're talking about. Then I had a shock in my life. Because at the end, Michael W. Campbell was pastor of the Montrose in Gunnison, Seventh Adventist churches in western Colorado. 
1919 Bible conference was the subject of his doctoral dissertation. <laughs> and I shook my head. I really shook my head in disbelief. That's it. <laughs> Campbell, although the transcripts were never published, he says there is no evidence suggest to suggest that they were hidden or kept secret mm -hmm. by the church leaders. Really? Well, that's not what I read in the notes and what you just read. After I, after I read that, I hit a button, letters to editors. And I sent a letter to, to, to review. I said, why is it, nice and down, I, I wasn't abusive, I said, why is it that the major part of this conference is not spoken of? Why is it that Adventists have been fed with this forced history? What did Benjamin Wilkinson call it? Twisted, history, twisted, oh, I can't remember how he put it now, I should have it. But he, he talks about a twisted idea of, of history where people uh, were being fed. So I sent this email, nothing happened, didn't get any reply. Sent again, uh, yeah, well, your letter, you know, it, it's been dealt with, it's been passed on, etc. Nothing again. So I sent back again a bit later, and what was I told? Sorry. Uh, the email address of this person we cannot contact. End of story. <laughs> That's it. 1920s onward. Prescott. This was um, a series of Bible studies for use in colleges. It's important. The son is equal to the father in everything except that which is conveyed by the term of father and son. He is equal to the father in that he shares to the full the father's existence from eternity. But it is much as the Father possesses these divine attributes from himself alone, whereas the Son possesses them as derived from the Father. Uh, in this real sense, and in this sense only, the Father is greater than the Son. But notice we're going into the co-eternal bit again. 1930s, Sabbath school lesson. Jesus was the Son of God before he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was the only begotten Son of God from the days of eternity. Good statement. Good statement. Sabbath School Lesson 1930. Now, 11 years after, 11 years after that Bible conference. You know, 1934, 15 years after. In our text in Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 5, 6, we find revealed our Lord's unique relationship to God, the Father, and also his unique mode of derivation from the Father. He was absolute deity, who was the Son of God by eternal generation, became flesh as the Son of God, and was designated to be the Son of God by the resurrection. Last part, all is yeah, fine, that's fine, but then we have eternal generation. You see what's developing. Now this is brilliant, this one really is worth studying. These 1936 Sabbath School lessons were ordained by the General Conference, right? And they were designed to make every Seventh-day Adventist a person who could give Bible studies to his neighbor. And you'll see some of the things that were said about them after. They were to continue for seven quarters, right? That's nearly two years, right? Sabbath School lessons explaining our faith, as we would say today, uh, 28 fundamentals, like explaining the 28. This is, this is what it says. This is a report of the final day session at the 1936 General Conference. Right? Beginning with the fourth quarter of 1936, the Sabbath school lessons for the denomination for seven seconds consecutive quarters are to cover the essential doctrines of this message. It is recommended that our people everywhere be encouraged to use these lessons as a basis for conducting Bible readings and cottage meetings in the homes of neighbours and friends, and that Bible training classes be organised in every church for this purpose. The lesson on the deity of Christ. The question is asked, you know how our Sabbath school lessons are set up, and the question in the text, of whom is Christ become? 1936. It's still there in our Sabbath school lesson in Psalm 2. Uh, this day I've begotten you, John 1.14, you know, the word was made flesh, the only begotten of the Father, etc. We're quoting. 
What testimony concerning his deity did Christ himself give? give John 16, 27, 28. We'll see that explained now. You, you can see John, John 8, 58 is where Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. The direct statement of Jesus is in the notes, the notes in the lesson study. I came forth from the Father. It reads literally, I came out of the Father. Putting with this his testimony in John 10, 38. The Father is in me and I in him. We have his personal witness that he truly was begotten of the Father, as John says in John 1, 14. 1936, several lessons. When does the prophet say the life of the Son began? Whilst we cannot comprehend eternity without beginning, without ending, yet it is dearly affirmed here that the, day, that the life which Christ possesses is from the days of eternity. Christ was with the Father before the world was from the day of eternity, before the foundation of the world, before all things. He was therefore no part of creation, but was begotten of the Father in the days of eternity and was very God himself. J. Roberts, this was in December 17th, this was near the end of that first quarter's lessons, all right? Has not the time come when each Sabbath school student who studies the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath school lesson should recite or teach that Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath school lesson to some who is without its blessings and truth, to a neighbour, to some friends, to a group of cottage meeting, as in a Sunday night sermon, and a tent or a hall, and some other way to other persons, all right? Should not each Sabbath school pupil lift up his eyes and look on the field of his own neighbourhood or circle of acquaintances that there is white to harvest and carry to that field the message contained in the present Sabbath school lessons? Should not each thus become an open channel as well as a reservoir of truth? The opportunity of a lifetime is now before us to teach the truth to our neighbours and communities or the Sabbath school lessons on the Bible doctrines are well adapted for that purpose. Now, watch these next two statements. The outline at the close of each lesson will helpfully guide in this matter as the present lessons on doctrines are fully authenticated by the lesson committee of the General Conference Sabbath School Department. This was not just one man's doing. They were authenticated by the General Conference itself. Anyone can know that what he teaches, because of this, obviously, anyone can know that what he teaches as he presents the lesson as a Bible reading or sermon is correct. Well, what mm -hmm. happens? But look at this one. Gets even better. With the instruction gained from week to week when several quarters have passed, the Sabbath school teachers should be competent instructors for baptism classes and can usually take charge of such classes for the evangelists. If there is no evangelist or pastor, then Sabbath school, the Sabbath school teacher can prepare candidates for baptism from, from the membership of his Sabbath school class and then request that a minister be sent to baptize them. So on what was being taught in these Sabbath school lessons, that it's there, it's enough to baptize a person. And they said, this is the truth, 1936. And they were still saying, Christ is truly the God, the Father. He is truly the Son of God. 1931, you're going to know that one. It was the first step, really, of getting the Trinity word into our fundamental beliefs. In the 1940s, to bring it into line now, to bring it into line, please remember, I don't want to lose, lose a thought. 1936, we were still teaching the whole world, you know, the world of Seventh-day Adventists, and the Seventh-day Adventists were going out into the world teaching what was in the 1936 lesson studies, that Christ was truly the Son of God. That was the laity belief. That was what was being taught in our Sabbath school. But what is happening up above, what is happening up above in, in, in the leadership realm, in the hierarchy of what there? 1940s, the editing of existing Seventh-day Adventist classics. Certain books 
that could not be taken out of public publication because they would have been a human crime. Majority of books, okay, uh, they run their course, don't know you know, and they stop being published, and you know, they go, they go back, they, they, they go to the back of the shelf type of thing. Two books that couldn't be done to. One, Erasmus Thoughts on Downloading and Revolution. That was an absolute classic, and you should see what Alan White has to say about, about that book. Right. Most people, I don't know, I've got the um, uh, quote in here, I uh, can't remember, but there's so many people that consist of that time, even that time, thought that book was inspired. I've got both copies, the 1944 edition yeah. and the earlier edition, yeah. and you put them side by side. No comparison. No comparison. I'll, I'll speak out. There is absolutely no comparison. You, you should, you've got to see it to believe it, to be honest with you. Uh, the other one was Bible reading for the home circle. Now, here comes a clue as to what was done. The next logical and inevitable step in the implementing of our unified fundamental beliefs involved revision of certain standard groups. This is Broome who was so involved in bringing this Trinity doctrine into the seven dimensions. He says, so as to eliminate statements that taught and thus perpetuated erroneous views of the God. Mm -hmm. Certainly, our views in 1940, according to the leadership, complete what was said in the 1936 Sabbath School lesson, it's erroneous. He says it's erroneous. So you see, what was going on down here in Valerti and what was going on, on, you know, with our leadership, two different things. Two different things. He goes on to say, the removal of the last standing vestige of Aaronism in our standard literature was accomplished through the deletions from the classic DNR in 1944. And the lingering sinful nature of Christ's misconception is remedied by expunging the regretful note in the revised Bible readings of 1949. Mm -hmm. That what was expunged was that Christ took our flesh as we had it, as it came from his mother Mary. From strong reactions, this is a sort of subtitle, strong reactions of Smith's adherents. The reaction of the minority, he says, and I don't believe it was a minority, I don't believe it for one minute. A reaction of the minority who still held personally to the Aryan view. Well, how can it be? We just had it in our 1936 Sabbath school lesson. How can you rid the entire Seventh-day Adventist church of a concept that's been there since 1844 or whenever? It was deep. It was deep in the thoughts of Seventh-day Adventists that Christ was truly the Son of God. He says, the minority who still held personally to the Aaron view and are regarded DNR as virtually inspired and therefore not to be touched in any way order. And he says, the objections he got was rather vehement, strong. Right? This is where we now come to the 1950s. This is where it's all been building up to now. We, we were almost there. What Wilcox uh, attempted to, what well, he did start, what well, he did start back there just after run away, you know, with this interdenominational thing is now coming to fruition. But before that could happen, our beliefs had to be changed from the top, because it wasn't going to be done by, by the laity, it had to be done by the top. And until those beliefs were changed on paper, we had no alliance with the evangelicals, nothing at all. Eric B. Sine. A few years ago, Walter Martin and Donald G. Barnhouse visited the GC Brethren for discussion on our religious beliefs. At the conclusion of their inquiry, they took our hand in Christian fellowship on the basis that we share with them the same evangelistic hope. Wow, what a statement again. Do we share the same hope? I think not. Sorry. Then Walter Martin, a researcher who was preparing a book on our church, right? he was going to, he, he was, Miss Walter Martin, he was a, uh, a person who was regarded as someone who exposes cults. That's what he was known for. And he was going to write a book against us. He pushed us, watch the words, pushed us for a more official and precise theological statement. He recognized that our theology was dynamic, changing. 
unchangeable. And had it been changing over the years, and so for the sake of accuracy, he wanted us to make up our minds. <laughs> Leadership saying one thing, Laity said something else. He was not interested in the consensus view in the field, the laity, only in the presently held beliefs of church leadership. Broom, Martin did not, of course, agree with certain special Adventist positions on the Sabbath sanctuary nature of man and the like, the specific test and truth as we regard them uh, for emphasis in these last days, but he nevertheless definitely believed that we are fundamentally Christians and brethren in Christ. Why? Because we had the Trinity doctrine. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. That's what they taught Martin. We've got the Trinity doctrine. We believe in the eternal deity of Christ and we believe in salvation by grace. Shake your hands. Welcome. Welcome aboard. Look at this. I've never got over this statement. His problem, Martin's problem, looms so large that in his concern, he then and there asked us, the leaders of Seven Downs' Church, to join him in praying for divine guidance and wisdom in this newly developed writing problem. What problem? He was going to say they're, they're Christians because they're Trinitarian, but all the rest of it, well, that's not scriptural. It's cultish. Sabbath, uh, sanctuary, investigative judgment. No. What are they doing now? This we did, and six of us dropping to our knees around the table and praying to that end. That is where we arrived at in 1956. And it was all started back there with the cross. Andreasen was very outspoken because what came out of these, these uh, talks with the evangelicals was the book Questions on Doctrine. And when that came out, Andreasen was furious. He says, this is a most interesting and dangerous situation. As one official was not in favor of what was being done, stated to me, we are being sold down the river. What a sight for heaven and earth. The church of the living God, which has been given the commission to preach the gospel to every creature under heaven and call men to come out of Babylon, is now standing at the door of these churches asking permission to enter and become one of them. How of the mighty fall. They were really strong words, you know. He says, this is more than apostasy. This is the giving up of Adventism. It is the rape of a whole people. It is denying God's leading in the past. How true are his words. Mm -hmm. And we're feeling, we really are feeling the results now of what happened back in 1956. It went on just after uh, L1 died. Barnhouse. Let it be understood that we made only one claim, i.e., that those seven day Adventists who follow the Lord in the same way as their leaders who have interpreted for us the doctrine position of the church are to be considered true members of the one body of Christ. So those people, those those laity down there who are still believing, not believing in the Trinity, and who believe that Christ was truly begotten, etc., etc., not members of the body of Christ. That's how Barnhouse figured it. George Knight, one of our chief historians, if a specific date can be given for Adventism's arrival at adulthood, it may best be seen as 1956, when the denomination had the right hand of fellowship extended to it by Donald Gray Barnhouse, editor of eternity and a highly influential fundamentalist leader. The acceptance of that fellowship, unfortunately but predictably, split the Adventist ranks between those who viewed it as a step forward and those who saw it as a sellout at the end. There was a huge split a massive split in Adventism in that time. When George Knight says, like it or not, the denomination did reach its adulthood. Well, did we really? Mm. Did we really? I know what we did reach our height of at that time. I think you can figure out what's on my mind. 
movement of destiny. What was he saying, movement of destiny? About a very, very early church. The majority were Trinitarians. Now this is the book. I became a, a Seventh Adventist and well, I was baptized in 75. I first came along in 73. The book was published in 71. I read this book and I read it through a couple of times too. You know? And why? Why did I believe it? Hey, it was a Seventh Adventist publication. Certainly, Froom was said to be one of our greatest, if not greatest, historians. Forty years in the making, this book. Forty years in the making. I thought, boy, I'm reading the truth here. The majority were Trinitarians and held to the complete deity of Christ as the spirit of prophecy lived consistency. A few were Arian. Then, in the 1860s and 70s, a few began to put into print their personal minority Arian views of Christ mm-hmm. and denied the Trinity and the personality of the Holy Spirit. How misleading can one person get? I was fooled by all this. I have to admit, I didn't know any different. I didn't, I didn't know. I, I had to study my history as I didn't have a clue. I just believed it. Merlin Burt said, referring to Froome's book, one is left with the impression that Froome chose not to, to, to present the facts, possibly out of a fear that it might undermine someone's faith, or of jeopardizing the church's evangelical mm-hmm. stand. Mm-hmm. That is the latter. That is the truth. Mm-hmm. Woodrow Whitten said, some such as prominent Adventist historian apologist Leroy Edmund Froome have been so embarrassed because of our non-Trinitarian position, obviously, that they have been sought to distort the Aryan historical record by making it appear that such views were something like an encapsulated cancer. Certainly they are, but not very widespread. Not saying what we know today, that the entire denomination, right through to Ellen White, decades beyond, was a non-Trinitarian denomination who believed that um, Christ was truly the Son of God. You, 1980 General Conference, you know all about that. And what trouble they had formulating this belief. They couldn't get the words right, and there was so much frustration going on there, so much toing and froing. And read the report sometime. I've got some on my website, and you can read it in the uh, Review and Herald, etc. But the very, for the very first time in our history, the Trinity Doctrine was voted in into our denominational fundamental beliefs. And today, today our church is standing for this, our leaders, our leaders, uh, they're standing for this uh, teaching as though everything in our denomination depends on it. And yet that is a complete reversal of how it used to be. Because we, we noticed yesterday, um, J.H. Father, he said that the Trinity Doctrine impacts the atonement in such a way that it destroys what Christ did at Calvary. It says that he didn't really die. Mm. As one minister said, we don't know how much he died. What do you mean how much he died? So a statement is that. But this is where we are today. This is our theology today. And I'm going to talk about something else tomorrow um, concerning the risk that Christ took in becoming incarnate. The Trinity Doctrine destroys it. As far as I'm concerned, I'll make this one statement. I've come to the conclusion today that the Trinity Doctrine, when it's understood what, what it's really saying, actually destroys the Gospel. It destroys the love that, that God has for each one of us. You know, it, it's an awful time. I can now see where some of our pioneers were so much against this doctrine. It destroys the fact that Christ is truly the Son of God. It destroys the fact that Christ actually died at Calvary for us. And if he had sinned, I don't go into it more, but he had lost, he lost his existence. And it, it forbids, it prohibits the belief that there was any risk to Christ. It destroys everything in one foul swoop. That's my presentation.